Hello everyone, I'm Robin Jackie from MathWorks Consulting Services, and here with me are Aubrey DeCuna and Javier Gazzari. Today we are going to show you how we use MathWorks tools to help automate the process of using experimental battery data to create a high fidelity battery model. We'll start off with some slides and demos, and then answer any questions you might have. Let's start with a quick primer on why we are doing this. Battery models are important for several reasons. First, system engineers need to integrate the battery into a larger system and need to predict the performance through simulation. Second, battery pack designers need to optimize the physical structure of the battery pack to maximize cell performance. And third, control engineers need to develop control algorithms for battery management when the battery is part of a complex system. The battery management system needs to provide information to other controllers. Detailed equivalent circuit models are common in recent literature. They include a voltage source, which accounts for the open circuit voltage of the battery. Then there is a resistor for the terminal voltage drop once a load is connected. A network of one or more RC branches accounts for the time constants and frequency response of the battery. For some chemistries, parasitic charging losses and self-discharge are significant. However, these are minimal with lithium chemistries and are often ignored. Finally, each of these elements in the circuit is a function of state of charge, temperature, and sometimes current or voltage. These relationships may be highly nonlinear. Most varieties of battery chemistry present some kind of modeling challenges. Some types of lithium ion cells, such as lithium iron phosphate, tend to exhibit things like lots of dynamic content in the cell's transient response. This can be difficult to capture in a model. The hysteresis of the open circuit voltage is also significant. The SOC versus open circuit voltage curve is important for a battery management system because we need to be able to use the open circuit voltage to correct our estimated state of charge, or SOC. To get an accurate SOC estimate, we need to have a very accurate voltage measurement. Hysteresis means that at the same SOC, the open circuit voltage depends on whether it was charging or discharging last. The open circuit voltage you measure will depend on the recent history of the battery, namely whether it was recently charged or discharged. The amount of rest time has an effect on the open circuit voltage. So if you waited for a long enough time, the voltage would be at a steady state value for any given SOC, regardless of history. Finally, some lithium ion chemistries have a nearly flat relationship in the middle SOC range. This makes it rather difficult to calculate an accurate SOC of the battery from just the voltage measurement, since the error in that measurement would be magnified. When we perform parameter estimation, our goal is to take experimental data with certain dynamic content and find the best possible parameter values to make the model match the data. In the remaining slides, I will show you the process we use to develop a model of a lithium iron phosphate battery cell. There are two things we did to achieve this. The first is that we selected the optimal equivalent circuit topology for our data and built a SimScape model of the equivalent circuit. Then we developed and automated a process to analyze the data using several tools to automatically populate parameters in the model to match measured data sets. We started by collecting experimental data, like you see here. We repeated this test at different temperatures and current levels. This data includes discharge pulses at constant current, followed by a rest period. Note that we took longer discharge pulses in the middle SOC range from those at the high SOC range. We did this because we knew there were more significant changes to the parameter values at the high and low ends of SOC. We plan to reduce the middle pulses from 10% to 5% SOC in our future work, as we found there to still be too much change between 10% SOC blocks in the middle range. How does this experimental data correlate to the equivalent circuit? Here's one discharge pulse. The rest periods before and after the pulse correspond to times when the SOC was constant but SOC was obviously different values before and after the pulse. Now the open circuit voltage, or EM here, is also constant during rest, 
It affects the voltage seen during rest when it is fully settled. The R0 values affect the instantaneous drop and rise at the beginning and end of a pulse. Then, the remaining RC branches in the circuit affect the dynamics of the model at the transients. So let's talk about how we automated the parameter estimation process. There are three main steps we used in finding the optimal parameter values. First, we needed to choose the best equivalent circuit topology. We needed to figure out how complex the model should be given our data. Second, we needed to find good starting points for the parameter values we wanted to estimate. We will show you how we used an analytic solution to find those automatically. And third, we performed a full layered and automated estimation process using Simulink design optimization to find the best overall solution to the problem. So the first step was to choose the circuit topology. For lithium chemistry, the question is often how many RC branches are required. To determine this, we looked at the voltage relaxation dynamics after the pulse. We then fit that data to exponential equations on different orders from 1 to 4. And we got a result like this for the curve fitting to the transient response. From this plot, it looks as if a, just a single exponential with one RC branch is pretty good. However, if we zoom in on the transient at the beginning, you can see that it makes a more significant difference. The more RC branches we used, the closer the beginning of the transient response of the model would match the data. After looking at this carefully, we decided that three RC branches was the best compromise between model complexity and fidelity for this data set. So our equivalent circuit model looked like this with three RC branches. And here is the Simscape model representation we used for estimation at a single temperature and current. On the left, you can see the open circuit voltage, which is dependent on SOC. On the right, the terminal resistance R0. And in the middle, we placed RC branches. One of these represents the slower time constant of the response, and the other two branches represent much faster time constants. The models use parameters R for resistance and tau for the time constant for the RC parts of the circuit. Using the time constant parameter helps us better visualize and understand the effect that each RC branch has on the simulated result. For this model, these circuit elements are best modeled using lookup tables. For example, this table shows a resistance R1 versus state of charge and temperature. This table is populated by the results of the parameter estimation process. The approach can give excellent flexibility for the model to match real data, provided that the tables have enough breakpoints and that the parameter estimation problem is set up well. For the parameter values versus state of charge, choosing the ta table breakpoints is an interesting topic. First, we found that it is very important to place the SOC breakpoints exactly at the pulse edges in the data sets. Even slight differences in the SOC values used for the breakpoints could cause the breakpoints to not line up well with the data. If the breakpoints are exactly at the pulse edges, then the table values are assured to only affect the portions of the simulated data that you expect. However, when you look at all the parameters, there are many table values to populate. We have found there are far too many to perform the estimation all at once. Now that we've determined the topology of the circuit model and discussed the lookup tables, I'm going to hand it over to Aubrey, who will discuss how we chose the initial parameter values before the primary estimation. If you have more than one RC branch in the model, then initial guesses for the parameters are very important. Starting from a good initial condition for each parameter makes a big difference in avoiding local minima and finding the best overall result. So, we developed an automated technique to measure approximate values for each of the parameters before starting the final estimation process. The technique for determining initial parameter values was a two-step process based on the analytical solutions of the equations governing RC circuits. Since the voltage drops across each RC branch are additive, we can analyze the branches one at a time. 
The first step made use of the fact that SOC was constant during the relaxation period, and therefore, so were the time constants. This equation is well known to have a, an analytical solution. The second step made use of the fact that the resistances and time constants vary linearly with time during the pulses. When the resistances and time constants are linear functions, this equation also has an analytic solution, though its structure is more complicated than during the relaxation period. Of course, the analytical solution makes some assumptions that are only approximately true, so it's not going to give a perfect result. However, it does get pretty close. This is the result from a discharge curve. The plot on the right includes the full data from the beginning of one pulse all the way until the very beginning of the next pulse. Because it's zoomed out, there's not much detail during the pulse itself. The left plot is zoomed in on the very beginning portion, which includes the discharge pulse and just a little bit of the relaxation. And here's a charge curve. As you can see, the blue line, which comes from the model, looks reasonably good during the pulse and almost perfect during the relaxation. On the lower left plot during the pulse, you can see the residual kind of trends up and down by a few millivolts during and after the pulse, which is a very important part of the data. I will now hand it back to Robin to give a demonstration of Simulink design optimization, which we use to finish the estimation. Our next step is to find the best overall fit for the parameters and try to remove those residual trends from the plot. We used Simulink design optimization to accomplish that. So let's look at a simple demo and then we'll come back and talk about how we automated the complete estimation process for the 3RC model. So here we have a simple model that has a 1RC equivalent circuit. So just to show you, initially we put in just some basic parameters that don't actually vary across the table. Um, so the blue line is the measured data set and the red line is the simulated data set. So if we want to fit this using Simulink Design Optimization, I'm going to go to the Analysis menu and then Parameter Estimation. This opens up a nice user interface that lets you import data, select the variables you want to adjust, and then perform the estimation. For, for the sake of time, I'm going to load a, um, a task that I've already set up here, and then I'm going to show you how I did that. So in this node of the tree, you import your transient data sets. Um, so here I've placed a, um, one data set that I imported. And if I plot the current, you can see it's got 10 current pulses there. And if we look at the output data that I set up, it has the voltage profile that goes along with that. Um, so the model is set up such that um, the inputs are, are current and voltage, um, and the output is, is just voltage here. So um, basically this, this tool is set up so that it will ma match, um, try to use this input current for the first input. It's ignoring the second one. Um, and then the output data um, is coming out here, is, is going to match um, match the simulation. So the next node here is variables. And this is where we set up the variables that we want it to adjust. So I've put in four variables here, um, R0, EM, R1, and C1. And in this case, you can specify um, your initial guess, um, which is just a variable from the workspace. Um, and it's got 10 different values there, a minimum and maximum range, um, and a typical value, which just gives the optimizer um, uh, something to kind of weigh the different parameters against each other. And in this node, you set up your estimation. Um, you can set up multiple tasks here if you want, uh, but I've set up a task here where I selected um, which data sets to use. In this case, there's only one. I've selected which of the parameters we're going to adjust in this task. Um, we don't actually have any initial states to tune, but this, this um, tab will allow you to tune initial states. And then we have this estimation tab um, where you can set up some options and then watch the estimation progress. Um, so you have the option here, um, if you like, to use parallel computing um, by checking this box. Um, and that will actually speed up the estimation by using the multiple cores on your machine. So I'm just going to start this. Um, it takes a few minutes, so I'm not going to run through the whole thing, but um, this is how you would um, perform the battery estimation. 
you can see in the background that it's actually running the model, um, comparing the error between the measured and simulated values. Um, and if we watch this progress, you would see the per, um, parameter trajectories as well as the change um, in the measured versus simulated result. Now let's get back to the larger model with three RC branches. In our early attempts, we tried to fit one discharge experiment all at once, like I showed, but that was extremely difficult. The problem is that with more than one RC branch, optimization solvers tend to get caught in local minima. There were also far too many parameters in the three RC model and too many pulse events to try and troubleshoot issues when things went wrong. Put into simple terms, the solution we used was to estimate parameters for each pulse separately. This greatly reduced the size of the problem by making each optimization have just a few parameters. It was, all, um, it was also a much more manageable problem to monitor in case there are problems converging upon an optimal solution. Of course, there was also a lot of data, so it was very desirable to automate all of these estimations. However, it's not straightforward where to break up the data sets when you do this. Consider that the SOC has a different but constant value during each relaxation period. However, during the actual discharge pulses, the SOC is changing. Now consider that the terminal resistance, R0, controls the instantaneous part of the voltage drop when the current input changes. This value also changes with respect to state of charge. So if you notice, the second value of R0 affects the place right after the first pulse and also at the beginning of the second pulse. We really needed to include both of these data points in any es given estimation task to ensure we got the best overall result that was balanced between these different locations. The technique we used was to layer multiple estimation tasks through a data set. So for example, our first estimation step began from the initial resting point and went until slightly past the relevant transition point. With that result, we could populate a few columns of each parameter table for the given temperature and current. Then we would proceed from that result. The next step would overlap the previous step, tuning only table columns that had not yet been fully covered in the prior step we would obtain the optimum values and then proceed to the next step. This entire process was automated, so it just needed to be set up and run. Another way to look at this is that we're exercising only certain table values during each step because of the SOC range that is used in each pulse. So in task one, we're primarily exercising just the first two columns of SOC. Then in task two, we're exercising the second and third columns. However, we don't need to tune the second column again since step one fully covered the portion of the data that exercised that value. One caveat with this process was that if one step did not give a good result, that would carry forward to the future steps. So we designed the process so that you could diagnose an issue make adjustments, and then continue from where it left off. We also used what we learned to continuously improve the process and make it more robust. Additionally, we saw a few odd behaviors in some data sets, particularly from a lithium polymer cell. For example, we occasionally observed that one charge pulse would have a concave shape, but then the next one would be convex. The model could sort of handle that type of behavior, but we weren't sure of the reason for fluctuations like that in the data. At low SOC, we also observed occasionally that the voltage would drop and then rise again during the relaxation after a charge pulse. This one could not be accounted for in the model that we used. Let's take a look at how the results look after choosing our initial guesses from our analytic solution and then after the final layered estimation with Simulink design optimization. Here's another result plot where the right side shows the full voltage data for one estimation task, and on the left we've zoomed in on just the area around the pulse event. 
you'll see the curve fitting from our analytics solution did a pretty good job of fitting the model to the data. However, the analytic solution requires making some approximations, so it's not quite a perfect fit around the pulse itself, and the residual trends to several millivolts of error. After the second pass with Simulink design optimization, where we perform the automated estimation, you can see these areas have been cleaned up nicely and the residuals hover around zero. Here's the equivalent set of plots for discharge pulses. You can see the same kind of trends in the data, and the layered estimation with Simulink design optimization improves the final result during the pulse event. Aubrey will now show you a quick demo of the function we created to do this automatically. Now let's take a look at the automated process in action. I've prepared a data file with current and voltage information for a full discharge cycle. You can see it here. For automation, we encapsulated the entire process into a single function. In the interest of time, I'm going to restrict to only two pulses. We then see a display of the model, followed by the fit determined by the initial conditions. As you can see, this initial guess is pretty good, but could use some work. Switching back to the MATLAB window, we can observe the progress of the estimation. Finally, we see the final fit for the first pulse, and the algorithm can moves on to the next pulse. Taking a look at the overall results from the experimental data, things look very good. The residuals are generally within a few millivolts, which is about the level of noise in the original measurements. The residuals grew a bit during the transients, but if you ignore the last pulse, they never exceeded about 18 millivolts. There are definitely ways to improve this. Increasing the order of the model, for example, would definitely add more flexibility. Another thing we tried was to make the time constants dependent on the polarization current, allowing the RC branches to have different time constants during the pulse and during relaxation. That cut the transient residuals roughly in half with a max of 9 millivolts. The charging data fit even better with just the normal 3RC model. There were only three pulses where the transient residual exceeded 10 millivolts for a sample or two. Here you can see the resulting lookup tables we created for this battery at one temperature and current level. Now I'll hand it back to Robin to discuss our conclusions. What can we conclude from this work? We think the layered approach was very successful. Mean residuals to the experimental data were within a couple of millivolts, similar to the noise in the measurement itself. It really can't get much better. At transients around each pulse, we saw residuals ranging from a few millivolts up to a max of about 18 millivolts. Whether this is acceptable may depend on the application, but it can certainly be improved by adding to the model. We cut these in half when we added current dependence to the RC time constants. And you could also add more RC branches to increase model flexibility to match data. While we found the approach to be rather complex to set up initially, we were successful in automating it, which led to significant time savings in processing a large number of data sets that characterize a battery cell. Automating the parameter estimation process is a complicated task. However, if you have lots of data sets to deal with, the benefits of automation are huge. MathWorks consultants can help. We've done this before, and we can help you customize a solution around your battery type and measured data sets. We focus on providing you detailed training so that you're self-sufficient and able to take on any future projects independently. Also, this SAE paper that we published in April 
2013 describes the layered estimation piece in more detail. You can obtain it from the technical literature section of the MathWorks website. We also have some simple battery models available on the MathWorks MATLAB Central file exchange website. You can also search the web or the file exchange for the words Simscape battery model to find it. Or you can simply contact your MathWorks representative. Thank you.